Hey folks, it's Chris Gordon with you here for DJB Productions Unsung Heroes. It's our first Unsung Heroes episode of the new year. So happy new year, everyone. And I'm really excited today because I get to spend some time and do the hang with the great Sam Unterberger, guitar player and rabbi. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be talking a lot about that. What's going on, Sam? How you doing? Oh, what's going on, sir? How you doing? Thanks for having me on the show today. Oh, man. It's all good, man. Happy to have you. Um, you know, we were talking earlier before we went live, we were talking about, um, we we're talking about genres and we're going to get into that, but you're the guitar player in a, a death metal band called abortion survivor. Yes. So, uh, that's, uh, was us, uh, let me kick off and get a little bit into that. Uh, how did this band come together and death metal, where, how, how is that a thing okay. with you? So, um, so the band started uh, probably 2017. Uh, the vocalist, guitarist, and I were in a band together previously called the Feetles. Um, and after Beatles, hold up, hold up, the Feetles. Oh yes, yeah. swear I can hear a Beatles thing going on. Right yeah, now. <laughs> the, the Feetles, F-E-T-A-L-S. Uh, we played together from 2007 to 2012. Um, at that point, jobs, careers, wives, kids, that kind of stuff kind of got, got, got to be our, our first focus. So we would put the fetals to bed. Um, but a couple of years later, we were all realizing that we were looking for something extra in our lives. Uh, mm -hmm. There was nothing that made us not play with each other. Just other things got in the way. So we kind of decided to get the band back together. Uh, added on some members from uh, another um, Philly band that we had played with previously and merged those two together. And so the Fetals have become Abortion Survivor now. So uh, I love that, the Fetals. I, I just. <laughs> <laughs> but, it would be interesting if you spelled it F E A T L E S or something well, like that. And I'll tell you, we, we did a merch design that was that sort of iconic. Uh, that the, the logo font, uh, but spelled with uh, with our, with our spelling, a little skull at the bottom of the T. So we definitely took that joke to its uh, its logical conclusion. No uh, worries there. Okay. That's awesome. uh, I spent some time visiting uh, the UK with my family. We went to visit Abbey Road, and of course, I have a picture of myself crossing the the crosswalk in front of Abbey Road Studios. Wearing my Feels T-shirt, and uh, that's great. Burger thought it was a it was a big hit, so that kind of so, so we got international acclaim there. Nice. Was uh so is it this it was so was the were the Feels the same uh, genre as Abortion Survivor? Not quite. Uh, the Feels were a little bit more alternative. We had some clean singing. I suppose you would call us metalcore. Because we definitely had, you know, those real heavy sections with screen vocals and breakdowns and double kick drums. But our, our vocalist at the time, uh, Derek Franchetti, was an amazing clean vocalist as well. Uh, he reminded me a lot of Lane Staley from Alice in Chains. And that was something that we wanted to incorporate in our music. Um, as time and tastes matured and moved on, we realized that wasn't necessarily something we wanted to keep including in the music. Whereas Derek wanted to focus a little bit more on that aspect of things, so he moved on to do some stuff that features his his singing voice, which is really a, a, a true prize, more more uh, front and center. And uh, we have since moved on to an all harsh Fox sound, so no clean singing on the Abortion Survivor albums. Yeah, I was listening to a little bit of Abortion Survivor, and that yes, that I definitely you know I definitely heard that. But it's got that definitive vocal. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a lot about that in, in the genre as well. Um, but you're a um, guitar player, uh, primary writer? Um, you know, we make sure that all of the writing in the Borsa Survivor is really a group effort. Um, obviously, every instrumentalist is sort of responsible for bringing musical ideas to the table. Uh, but it truly is a collaborative process, and that's one of the things that's made it so comfortable for me to be in, you know, several incarnations of the of this act. Uh, my other guitar player, uh, Maddie Fiedel, and I, we've written songs together for 15 years at this point, so we're very comfortable with each other, with each other's writing styles. 
Uh, but Jay, Scott, and Kenny, uh, the uh, vocalist, drummer, and bassist, respectively, all bring in their own, uh, their, their, their songwriting talents to the table as well. Uh, Jay is primarily our lyricist, uh, but you know, song titles and lyrical content is a shared source of inspiration. Uh, we've got a, a thread in our band Discord where we just keep a running tally of new song ideas and, and, and uh, new, new lyrical content. Uh, a lot of it is very much not safe for work, but that's sort of the, the, the spirit of the band and what we're trying to do. So uh, we try to work together, um, and that keeps it fresh. So uh, that's cool. That, that's everyone collaborating and, and writing together. Um, you know, unlike many situations where a lot of it's a, there's a sole writer and uh, they have to kind of fall into yeah. that particular writer's vision. Um, so that's right, that you guys are collaborating together, writing together. Did you write? Well, obviously, see now it's, it's not like it was, but in general, are you in a room together and yeah. cranking out ideas? Or do you come in with like preset ideas? And I'm, that's a leading question. There, I have a reason for asking that. But I, well, when you go get into a room and start working on a song together or a piece together, are you coming in with fully realized ideas, or is there that kind of ebb and flow of a jam session going on where you? Oh, it's one hundred percent the ebb and flow of the jam session. Um, I think most of our writing sessions come up, start with with one of us saying, "Okay, here's a musical riff or a concept or an idea that I had, and here's thirty seconds of music." And we just keep playing that 30 seconds of music over and over again. And it gives me, it gives the, the other guitar player a chance to learn that, that song or the bass player or whoever needs to learn it to learn the actual music. And then once we've got the basic groove down, we all kind of start tinkering, with the, tinkering and toying with it and, and trying different things and saying, all right, what if I play a harmonized lead here? Or what if I'm playing something super aggressive and palm muted here? And we kind of start working from there. Um, but it's very much uh, a, a, a jam session, um, and that does make it. It makes it feel more of a group effort than okay. Here's this song that I wrote, and I want you guys to play this to that song. Yeah. Now that's a little bit of a double-edged sword, actually. Uh, there's times when I've brought an idea to a to table, and I have a very preconceived notion of what I think it should sound like once it's fleshed out and all the other parts are added. But someone else hears something that's not the same thing that I heard, and they decide to go in that direction. Well, right. maybe that's the direction that the song goes in then, and maybe it's not my original vision. And that's been a little bit of a, a growing process me as a songwriter to have to kind of roll with those punches and say, okay, just because I thought this was going to go this way doesn't mean that's the way it's going to go. Right, right. Yeah, and that's a, that's a, a good way to put it, you know. Uh, at the end of the day, obviously, as a band, you step away from it and you're comfortable and, and, and happy with the results. But sometimes it's tough to get past that, you know. And, uh, you know, I think we, we work very hard as a band to remember the fact that we are friends and family members as well as being in a band together. And, you know, obviously, anytime you're in that close and intense relationship with four other people, Things can get tense, things can get intense, um, but we've done a really good job of being able to kind of keep the, the music writing aspect of it separate from our personal lives and to keep our personal lives separate from the music writing aspect of it. There's not a lot of ego. Um, we're all very open to give and take. We're open to notes. We're open to criticism. We're open to, nah, I don't think we're gonna do that. And and that's, that's an important thing. Um, and you know, to some extent, it's, it's the majority rules, but we really don't harbor grievances or grudges. I mean, at this point, I've been working with Jay and Maddie, like I said, 15, 20 years at this point. We know each other very well. We know our, our personalities and our roles and responsibilities in the band, and I think we're all very comfortable with it. That's cool. So it, it, it makes things really easy. Um, we don't have to spend a lot of time molly coddling, and that's a good thing. Molly coddling. Yeah, you don't have to, you know, uh, uh, soften, soften your, your attack just to preserve somebody else's fragile sense of self. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's a, that's a really good idea, you know, because it's tough. Bands, bands can be tough. Bands are tough. I definitely, 
I get that idea too, because you know when you're writing, you yeah, I tend to produce my demos, which mm -hmm. is as you said, is not always a good thing because nope. <laughs> bring that to the band and they're sitting there going, well, what do you want me to do? Like I. Oh, I just learned this. Now I'm in a now I'm in a cover band. You know that kind of right, thing. exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's great that you have that way of being able to bounce ideas off, and that yeah, and I, I think some of the most creative bands are the ones that do have that internal push and pull. But as you said, it's not personal. It's, uh, it's hey, this is the band. We're we're going to have disagreements. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. Part of the creative process. So um, getting back to the band. <laughs> and this is this is I'm going to be probing into because I've been kind of always curious about this. So the name of the band, Abortion Survivor, yep. old school death metal. You, you, yep. you would if if you were to put a moniker on it. But where do the names come from? And this I don't mean that in a not being pithy when I say that. Like I've always been curious about, you know, is this a collaborative effort where you guys are like. Hey, I have an idea for a name for this band. So I'll say this about that. Um, so like I said, you know, Abortion Survivor came about um, sort of rising of the ashes from two former bands. Okay. Um, I was the, the second to last to come back into the fold just because I had a little bit of a, uh, a busier life, a little bit. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't necessarily ready to commit back to being full time in a band yet. Uh, but eventually I got the call and of course I was excited to do so. But the band name had already been decided before oh. I uh, stepped back into the fold. Um, you know, I mentioned that our our the the three of us were previously in a group called the Fetals. So mm -hmm. there's already sort of this baby birth kind of concept that's been rolling around in our heads for for 15, 20 years. Our practice spaces have always been called the womb. You know, um, and that's just been sort of a, a rolling theme. Um, the show, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, has mm -hmm. this where one of the characters uh, uh, finds out that, that his birth was not necessarily desired mm -hmm. and that there may have been steps taken to circumvent his birth. Mm -hmm. And he comes to the realization that he is an abortion survivor. Oh, cool. Now, that's where the, the actual name came from specifically, uh, but it definitely fit our tongue-in-cheek approach. Uh, it definitely has enough shock value to at least raise an eyebrow, mm -hmm. but it's also keeping with the baby theme and something that we've actually made to, to try very hard to do and I think have, have succeeded to some extent. We play shocking death metal that will definitely offend your grandmother, but it's all PG-13. We have zero nudity in any of our art or our t-shirt designs. We have zero profanity or vulgarity. Uh, there is nothing that is going to upset you about our records other than the thoughts and ideas described there. No visual imagery, no language that's going to be deemed offensive or anything like that. We get away without a, a parental advisory warning. Oh, interesting. Wow. So, you know, um, we've got a, a, a YouTube channel, um, and, and our, our band camp has all the lyrics available for fans to look at and read if they're interested. But while the lyrics are funny and maybe express some comedic violence, there is nothing that you wouldn't feel inappropriate about saying in front of your, your religious leader at, at services on, on Saturday or Sunday morning. So... That's something that, you know, I don't know that it was necessarily intentional, but once it sort of evolved, we decided to stick with it, not limit our ability to broadcast on any venue. Right. But, but there's... I, yeah. The, the, the economy I, of that is, you're, is you're, you're a little amused by this, and yeah. No, I, I think it's, I think it, look, I, I, uh, I always, you know, I've done a lot of session work, and I, and I, I'm, like, there was a, it was a death, technical death bit metal band that I played a bunch of guitar solos on and uh, the album was called Into the Fire. I can't remember the name of the band. There's been so many that I've done session work for, but I remember I just it's funny not funny haha, but an interesting dichotomy there because it's like this stuff is digestible to to any listener, to to anyone without being offended. But the funny thing is that it's 
the the title of the band is sometimes sometimes the basic imagery of of this of this music as you said was is kind of set to shock it's kind of like a little bit of a punch to the system like mm-hmm. you, know, you know um if you talk about bands like cannibal corpse and, and things like that and then abortion survivor and uh that's interesting that you know your lyric content and this sounds like it was conscious this was a conscious thing that you were like guys all of you like you get, i mean was there ever a time where you went over the line where you you just there was a piece or a lyric idea that you're like the only way we're going to get through you know to, to get this to come to fruition we have to go there. you know kind of like no. a movie director that's like i gotta put that scene in you know uh, honestly i uh, uh, no no, uh, okay. one of the things that I really like about Jay as our vocalist and, and, and primary lyricist is his ability to convey these ideas and write these stories without necessarily, I'll use the word stooping without the prerogative, but, but, but without stooping to, to profanity or, or to um, um, more offensive lyrical concepts. Right. Uh, you know, to some extent, uh, uh, Two of our, our band members have have families uh, with young children, um, and we like the fact that there's no reason we can't play our records for our own kids. Right. Uh, that's a nice. Oh, that's great. That's that's a cool concept, and it's interesting too because you're uh, not only a guitar player, you're a rabbi. <laughs> well, first to clarify any miscommunication there, I am not officially a rabbi by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, you're not uh, officially a rabbi. No, 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 not even close, not even close. A rabbi is someone who has definitely gone to four years of traditional college, if not more, in order okay. to receive very specialized uh, biblical and religious training in the Jewish faith. Um, I am merely an enthusiastic amateur um, after I went through religious school as a youth, um, I was presented with the opportunity to start assisting in the uh, religious education classrooms. So as of 15, 16, you know, before I left high school, I was already sort of in that environment. Uh, my parents were both very involved. I myself was very involved. So for 15, 20 years or so, I have live and I have led uh, uh, religious youth services, uh, either as in the form of schooling on Sunday mornings or um, as specific youth services on some of our uh, more holy holidays. Um, and that's something that, you know, it started as a job. It started as a paycheck, I'll be very honest. When you're 15 years old and you're getting uh, $20 an hour to basically babysit some kids on Sunday mornings, that's going to be a very, uh, very attractive uh, financial offer. Um, yeah. But as I did it longer and longer and I, I, I became more comfortable with it and I, I did better and better with it, it became just a way for me to express and relate to my religious background and upkeep um i'll let you know i'm i'm not particularly theistic if anything i would consider myself a satanist more than any sort of traditional western mythology i don't have the same belief in a father figure sitting in the clouds that a lot of religious uh attitudes uh tend to prescribe but i see the value that a strong grounding in community and family and positive values and instilling the importance of education instilling the importance of community of giving of yourself without the thought of uh, uh tangible reward has always sure. been very important to me and so i chose to express my religious experience rather than going to services and worship which didn't really do anything for me uh through uh more acts of service and 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 sort of uh uh, there's an important concept in Judaism called Lador Vador, and that translates roughly from generation to generation. And it's the idea that the things that we've been taught for years be carried out and be passed on to the next generation. So that's, that's the way I've, I've found my religious meaning in life, is that uh, I may not be uh, kosher, I may not be Shomer Shabbos, I may not you know, do those more uh, ritualistic practices but i do see the value in the faith i do see the value in the 
in the stories and the lessons and the the, the concepts behind it. And it was sure. important to me to keep that in my adult life. So I've tried oh, that's to awesome. pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. you're. <sighs> It's more of a, in a practitioner of, well, of life, but being, understanding that that, the idea of religion has its place mm -hmm. in a Very society, so. but it's not necessarily. Uh, I think. I think any religion, can do the good things that I found through Judaism. Okay. So I don't think that the, the, the good and the positivity that I found is necessarily only through Judaism, but I have found, at least in my personal experience, Judaism does the best job of passing on the good stuff that I do approve of without passing on a lot of the bad stuff that I don't necessarily approve of that can be found in other major religions. Now, you know, I'm not here to, to point fingers or cast aspersions to anyone, but I like... Um, the fact that Judaism is a lot about cafeteria style religion and it's better to do something than nothing and if this part has meaning for you then you can go ahead and take this part If this part doesn't have meaning for you then you don't need to go ahead and take that part and you're not a bad Jew just because you don't do the thing that doesn't mean something to you right. um, what's better uh, wrote observance of a ritual just for for performances sake or actively doing something that has some meaning and some value that that will be you know provide meaning to your life and, and meaning to other people's lives and, and benefit to your life and other people's lives sure so that's how i've chosen to to interpret it and pass those on wow that's very cool um you know it's uh, I'm, I'm sure as you can imagine having that kind of duality between uh uh you know uh, uh heavy metal on on friday and saturday night and then uh religious school on <laughs> saturday and sunday morning can be a pretty uh, interesting uh, uh, duality to try and live. Um, I was telling uh, uh, Danny before we got on the air, there have been several times where I've had to wear a death metal t-shirt underneath a suit and tie, gone off to a religious observance, and then, you know, quick change uh, on my way up to the stage, someone hands me my guitar, and I'm wearing like a tie over a Cannibal Corpse t-shirt as I'm playing on stage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. there, there are definitely videos of me out there performing in full uh, 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 dress gear, uh, whereas the rest of my bandmates are in total rock, rock and roll garb. Nice. Uh, there have also been some very, very, very hairy Sunday mornings after long Saturday nights that continued perhaps into Sunday morning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, kids, we're going to put on a video today. Beep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. 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 That's wild. That's cool, though. I think I think duality is an interesting thing. I think it's a good thing in a lot of ways, too, because I, I think there's, in you know, all things in life, there's a, there's a duality. I have always kind of, uh, one thing I used to, Always think about from, what, you know, from time to time and think about is that the very things that give us life take them away as easily and uh, I've always been fascinated with that that duality in yeah. things so Look, it's I also agree I think it's finding it's, a balance and that's the, you know that's important uh, yeah you know, that's light and dark life and death it's it's uh, it's all about finding that line in between yeah and, and being in that line you know that's awesome. So, is is that any of that subject, like the stuff you were just talking about, is any of that covered? And and do you go there with the writing with this uh, with the band? No, not at all, not at all. Um, like I said, uh, the Jay is definitely our primary lyricist and uh, uh, vocalist. So he tends to take much more of the active role in what our songs are about. Uh, we may come up with a title. Uh, we may come up with an overall concept, but then we sort of send him off to do his thing. Uh, you know, very often we'll have you know instrumental practices, and Jay will duck out a little bit early so he can go home and write write lyrics and in peace and quiet instead of listen, listen to us clatter around on our instruments. Um, our our lyrical content tends to be way more in the guar serio comic style of lyricism. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're definitely a fan of the over-the-top cartoon violence. Um, again, we, we, we take 
our music and our product seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. So you're not going to hear our, 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 us come out with, you know, 12-minute uh, prog songs, uh, waxing philosophic on the, on the, the menialities of life and death. Uh, we're really much more going to be talking about, you know, Riddled with STDs is, you know, one of our, our favorite songs. It talks about the various uh, symptoms that you might undergo if right. you, in fact, were riddled with STDs. And, you know, we, we, we try to make people leave with a little bit of a smile on their face and, and a little bit of a knowing wink. Um, you know, maybe we'll get more serious as time goes on. That seems to be a, a, a trend with, with metal musicians as they grow up and mature. Um, on the other hand, like I said, at, at, at 37, 38, I'm on the younger side of the band. So I don't know how much more maturation is really going to occur at this point. I think we kind of reached that level. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I really feel like if you saw us at our practices and then you heard the album, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's what these guys would write. You know, it's a lot of the uh, pot smoke and fart jokes. and and I, I hope that that comes through effectively on the record. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. So what talking about these genres? And we were talking about this before we went on, but it seems to me uh, that it's gotten pretty insane with labeling these genres of, you know, death metal, black metal, thrash metal. These are the those were the names of the subgenres mm -hmm. were up. and they were you had metal you had hair metal too um, I was in LA doing hair metal for a brief time um, back in the day but now so now there's an expansion on these names what, what's your insight on how that came to be and what are the what are the differences you know what are the I mean I, I can hear certain differences but there seems to be certain rules that have to be applied. You know, for instance, you know, I was known as a neoclassical shred artist for many years, right? And I was okay. like, neoclassical. Well, that's different than if I, you know, I could still be shred, but I might not play that particular. Well, exactly. So, so I think, you know, uh, so first and foremost, let me say this. I think that genres and labels can be helpful in assisting newcomers to a genre finding more music that's in line with what they like okay but just because that these sort of labels exist i think people get really hung up on them and they get super caught up and well is this this or is this this and at the end of the day that doesn't really so much matter if you can make an effective argument for either side of that point then you've sort of negated it altogether but to use your example so you're talking about uh, uh shred guitar mm -hmm. um ingve malmstein is probably the, the the universally regarded master of neoclassical shred guitar mm -hmm. uh, he is a huge uh uh listening influence if not playing influence i don't want to pretend that i sound like ingve by any stretch of the imagination but so ingve is but so but ingve is a shred guitar player right yes so even though at the time, though I'm going to say this at the time, because I I, I played in an Ingve tribute band for four or five years, uh, back when I had the hair, and uh, so that name was never used back then. Back in the '80s, no one said shred. It wasn't used. It was what, never what used. Was, what was the the genre? Of it, he was neoclassical metal it was often the genre but it's funny because we didn't use the word shred to describe someone's playing we use the word terrifying we use words like that we use adjectives like oh that too scary or oh man but it wasn't until this next wave that actually happened in like the late 90s early 2000s where the word shred really became a thing even though it had been used here and there but i was it was never something so, I'm, I'm staying with your point though. So, but yeah, so yeah, he is considered and so considered the pioneer of shred. Classical guitar virtuoso, Inge is the guy. Virtuoso was used. But Alan Holdsworth is a virtuoso. Yes. Now, does Alan Holdsworth sound 
anything like in my mom's team? No, obviously and, not. And and would a would a Holdsworth fan cross over effectively to a Malmsteen yeah. fan by default? Well, yes, I can say that because one of my last guests, Scott McGill, sounds literally like Alan Holdsworth and Ingvay Malmsteen had a kid. Okay. And was babysat I, by Joe Pass. Okay, and I was gonna say I was gonna throw John McLaughlin as my as my, as my next uh, example, yeah. but Joe Pass. Okay, so he's another virtuosic, masterful guitar player right. that sounds nothing like Holdsworth and right. nothing like Malmsteen. So yes, you can say guitar virtuoso is a genre, yeah. just like death metal is a genre. Sure. But what if I really want to listen to guys like uh, Michelangelo Badio and Joe Stump and uh, 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 what's the guy? Uh, Jeff Loomis. Right. Those guys all fit into this category. On the other hand, if I go to a record store and I look in their guitar virtuoso section and all I see is Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, well, again, masterful guitar players, they don't sound like Gingbe. And if I want that neoclassical sound and all I'm presented with is Vi and Satch, I'm not going to get what I'm looking for. Right. Now, at the end of the day, are they all virtuosos? Are they all shredders? Yup. But is there enough difference in the sound that someone who's looking for one thing won't get that? Yeah, but it's interesting, though, because because that's now virtuoso in the guitar community is now labeled as, you know. Mm hmm shredders if you will i i definitely see your point in the sense that yeah if i went to if i went to say there was a spot in a record store that said shred guitar players you know right. i would expect to see guys like joe uh, joe stumps a good friend of mine i do a dead on impersonation of that guy uh which drives him nuts <laughs> I, I can call joe up and call as joe <laughs> joe, joe on joe joe on joe yeah yeah, I think it rubs. I think it gets on under his skin from time to time. But uh, the, the point being is, so yeah, I could go with that, and I'm probably going to find Joe Stump or or Michael Romeo from Symphony X, someone like that. Yeah, yeah. John Petrucci solo albums, right? But, but yeah, Petrucci is gonna... starting to verge on the other side, and he's starting to move out of that strict neoclassical vibe. Who's that? Petrucci. Yeah, well, I never really considered Petrucci neoclassical at all. Right. I mean, he took elements throughout mm -hmm. uh, his stuff. To me, he's a uh, just an expansion of, of in a much heavier progressive way, but I still hear his influences, which, of course, is Steve Morris. I hear Steve Morris mm -hmm. everywhere in his playing. Not so much in every aspect, but it, it definitely, like, oh, that's clearly a Steve Morris fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That goes back to what you're saying. It's like all these... So yes, there are even in that sense. So I see where you're going with that, which is like, in, even in that sense, in the world of guitar, or even in the world of shred guitar, you have these kinds of little subgenres. Um, but I, I, it doesn't seem to go to that point of these long, I mean, they're long labels, dude, they're long labels. So I, I I'll, I'll speak even more to that. So I, I'm part of a, 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 I'm very active in the Facebook uh, music community. Okay. Um, I run and manage a couple different groups and pages, you know, 100,000 participants. So I, I'm relatively, got my, I've got my finger on the pulse of, of what people are listening to. Okay. Uh, in, in the extreme metal community in this day and age. And there is a huge amount of difference. Um, there, there are something of a local act, Rivers of Nile. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, I've heard, I've heard that. Yeah. Okay. So they released an album last year that, in addition to being, my, or not last year, sorry, Jesus, a long time ago at this point, 2017, 2018, uh, called Where Owls Know My Name. This is their third studio release, and I would consider this progressive death metal. And the reason I say this is because there are sections that are absolutely blindingly intense blast beats double kick bass drums lightning fast guitar riffs that, that have no discernible melody to the average listener and they're just all out sonic assault right. then there are songs and several songs in this album that feature 
saxophone over mellower acoustic organ passages. They've got clean sung vocals in some areas, again, as a texture, not as a primary aspect. But it, it, they are lush sonic son soundscapes that, that go way beyond what you would expect from a traditional, quote unquote, death metal band. Right. They have, other than something like that, very, some very surface level comparisons, almost nothing in comparison with a technical death metal band like Defeated Sanity, whose right. job is simply to play the most number of difficult notes as possible at 300 beats per minute, where sure. that is just an all-out sonic assault for the entire length of the album, and you need to exhale when you're done listening because it's almost an exhausting experience. Mm -hmm. um, just the way you, you're in different moods when you're looking for what virtuoso guitar player you want to listen to, there are times when you're in different moods with the death metal you want to listen to. Um, one of the things I have not trouble with, but 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 that I, 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 I focused on is trying to find death metal that I can go to sleep to. Because very often, it's it's not that the volume, obviously volume is entirely controllable, I can play yeah. soft death metal. But I find some of the stuff is so attention grabbing that it doesn't let me drift off. Yet, I have listened to this Rivers of Nile album more than just about any album I can think of in the past 10, 15 years. It, it, it's going to be it's gotta be one of my top 20s of all time. I urge everyone to go, go out and listen to that. Rivers of Nile, Where Owls Know My Name. Um, I can put that and go to sleep. Not because it's boring, because it, it gives me the opportunity to relax and sort of <sighs> exhale a little bit. Um, and you know, I don't think there's necessarily one that's better than the other. I listen to a lot of super technical music where it's all about focusing on the guitar player's mastery of the instrument and the drummer and blah, 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 and all of this and that. And then I also listen to a lot of slam. And slam is what cavemen would make if they played death metal. If you play over the fifth fret, you're wrong. And, you know, I mean, it's just like mind-numbingly dumb metal. But it's fun. <laughs> and it's aggressive, and it's loud, and it sounds absolutely nothing like the technical stuff that I listen to, and it sounds nothing like the atmospheric post-metal that I listen to to go to sleep, and it sounds absolutely nothing like the, 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 the melodic power metal that I use to, to inspire me to play guitar. I mean, it's, it's different strokes for different folks, and, and, and different... different seasonings for different seasons. You know, there's, there's a right band for the right time. And so I think the labels can help you figure out, okay, is this what I want to listen to now? Hmm, no, probably not. But I also think, like, it's all music, and it's right. all different flavors. That's, this, is what, this is what fascinates me about this, and this is what fascinates me about the rabbit hole you and, you and I are going down here, is it seems that the song, uh, certain pieces or, or like, um, the idea where a, a band that would be labeled as a, a progressive uh, thrash band, say, but they start to experiment and just start to throw more things in. The more they throw into that, that becomes another genre. It almost, mm -hmm. in a way, right? It almost becomes another genre. And, but, but for branding purposes and for categorization, to, for, to, lead, to, to lead to their demographic, to lead to their listeners, say, you know, so people have this kind of thing but it's interesting that the because when there was a point i remember coming up where there would be we called it experimental and they would be experimental and you would never know it was like potluck let's see what this this is going to do you know but they seemed to find a way that the more experimental you got then there was yeah, okay and further on that point is then there became this kind of rules of the game like you were talking about the, the slam if you play above the fifth fret you're wrong right <laughs> uh, if if i was like if i labeled myself as a neoclassical guitar player and there was not a diminished arpeggio to be found I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. yeah so there seems to be these rules of the game and and i understand that because obviously if you're going to brand yourself a certain way if i if i recorded uh 
you see this on Spotify and stuff like that. If I recorded a real a, a aggressive shred guitar thing, and I turned around and said, it's kind of like Alan Holdsworth. People listen to, you know, what? It doesn't sound anything like Alan Holdsworth, right? <laughs> kind of going back to what you were saying earlier. So it's the same principle, right? So I, it just seems it's interesting that that with these subgenres that you're talking about in the in, in the death metal, uh, what is it, progressive metal, grindcore, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them are slipping out of my head as quickly as they're coming in, and that's not disparaging. It's just, but well, each of them have their little microcosmic kind of. So I've heard this said. I've heard my students argue with each other over this. That's not correct. This is this. No, this is this. No, this is this. And, yeah. and that's what I mean, where the stuff gets a little gatekeepy and it gets a little insular and it gets a little ridiculous. But is it that is it that the dichotomy though? Because they. They start to bring in these other elements of ideas. It's almost the listeners actually doing this now. The listeners coming and going. Wait a minute. No, now we got to call it this. And I and I think it's maybe a part of the human condition. We like yes. to, we need to feel. Uh, well, it, it, it's dichotomy. It's our ability to classify and identify based on common traits. And once you're able to organize and place things in categories or labels or cubby holes it's easier to understand and digest and it's easier to define a band and say okay these guys are this they have this sound this sound and this sound that makes them this genre i can now put them here and they're there these guys have this sound this sound and this sound i can put them there right. and that organization is definitely something that's part of human nature Look, it's why, it's why we classify the difference between a red oak and a white oak, you know, because someone along the line said, okay, these are the things that make a white oak a white oak. These right. are the things that make a red oak a red oak. Now, yeah. again, when you're not dealing with, with biology, you, there's a little bit softer, blurrier edge. And you know, I mentioned slam. There's this. See, I never heard of that before. I think that's cool. Okay. Uh, so, I, I, <laughs> slam. So, Yes, slam. Go, go listen to uh, internal bleeding. Um, go listen to cranium. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll give you some links. Uh, yeah. um, it, after the, the, um, the name, I, a lot of it's in the like the name is part of that brand. It's like if you heard, if you said to me, uh, cranium. People in the know, uh, like yourself, not me, because learning about this today, they would know. They're like cranium. Cranium is in one of the, they, they are sort of like the, you know, the, the big four of thrash. I would yeah. say that Cranium is decidedly in the, the, the big four of slam along with Abominable Putridity. Definitely check these guys out. Um, yeah, but again, it, the, the, the genres are just for easy referencing. Mm -hmm. I can say slam instead of saying slow, groove-oriented, steeply down-tuned metal that bases their on on chromatic descending riffs on detuned guitars with guttural vocals. See now that I've heard, I know that one. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't need to say all of that stuff. Yeah, I can just say slam. Yeah. And if you're in the genre and you're familiar with it, you say, okay, if he says slam, that song probably has these three or four elements to it right. that I know and I'm right. comfortable with and I'm expecting. Right, that's and the that's, brand, right? That's, I, the brand. that's the brand. What I expect. Uh, right? when, when you say uh, 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 technical death metal, I know way ahead of time. I'm looking at fast tempos. I'm looking at guitar wankery. I'm looking at probably uh, 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 fingered, not picked bass, possibly fretless. Um, I'm looking at longer song structures. You know, there, there's just certain, like you said, the, the, the rules of the road or, or, or I guess I, I don't like to look at them as rules. I like to look at them as guidelines, as suggestions, as, um, well, yeah, so that's, that's okay, but, yeah, but that's, I went, went, to, went to fine art school and, and she said that everything in art is acceptable as long as you can argue the point one way or another. And to some extent, I, I, I very much agree with that. And that you can, it's important to know art or music theory or genre history, whatever you want to call the, the, the ruling paradigm. If you understand it, 
then you can intentionally break the rules knowing that you're intentionally breaking them. Mm -hmm. And it's very different for someone who knows that they're intentionally breaking a rule to break it than there is for someone to just go bull in a china shop and go crazy. Right. And which is why, you know, Mondrian painting circles and squares is major modern art, whereas if I did that at home, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that's right. kind of where I come, come, come at it. It's important to know where you come from. It's important to know your history. It's important to know what bands came together to create this kind of sound, where and when. You know, Thrash was Bay Area in the early to mid 80s. Uh, Slam started in upstate New York in the late 90s, early 2000s. So yeah. I know that. Okay, great. I can go listen to those classic slam bands, and I can listen to the, the suffocation riff that started the genre, and I can learn that. Great. And then I can also say, okay, but you know what? For this song, I don't want to do just that. I want to do that plus something else. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get that genre of bifurcation. Well, now is it slam? Is it progressive slam? Is it technical melodic slam? You know? So... Yeah. And I think you'll see a lot of those modifiers also being used in multiple genres. Technical is not necessarily a genre in and of itself. It's more of a modifier of some existing genre. So you can have technical black metal, technical thrash metal, technical death metal, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. I see. All right. So so even on that point, they are modifiers on certain things. Oh, yeah. 100%. I mean, yeah. you can use technical, progressive, melodic, brutal in any one of those sort of overarching genres that you start off by saying black, death, yeah. thrash, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And that's where you, where you get those, those absolutely ridiculous, you know, technical blackened post-thrash with the melodic influence. Right, yeah. exactly. Well, that's, that's what I was saying earlier. Sounds, it, it, it sounds like, it sounds on, like, on, a, a, it sounds like the, the title of the genre is The Recipe. But, but, but you know what? You nailed it. What's a recipe other than a list of ingredients? Right, right. And what's a genre other than a list of the things that make up that genre? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think you, you hit the nail on the head with that one. But it's interesting when you, you think about, um, you know, okay, and, and I think the parallel there is that now when you go out and you eat, you know, it's all there, right? Like a lot, even the names of some of the foods that are served are really just, little abbreviations of everything that's in it just you know can be a good thing you know mm -hmm. I, I personally like to know what i'm eating uh but, even to the point of where did it come from but my point I, being is so that's okay so now i now i start to really it, it really seems to just not not that it ever needed justification in that idea but it makes a lot more sense and from a business standpoint the branding is, is, is going to kind of streamline, especially now with, with where it's playlists, Spotify, however you're distributing your music, exactly. especially digitally, that you know that there's going to be that that group, you know. So because we have to now be our own record labels as well. Well, and and it's funny you mentioned that you know, especially with abortion survivor, not really fitting into a hyper focused niche. That's been something of a difficulty or not or or, or a uh, an area of opportunity or or i would say a problem but you know we don't clearly fit one niche label so when it comes time to market us for shows that can be a little weird we're not necessarily straight slam enough to play with the slam bands but we're not core enough to play with the death core guys but we're not old enough to play with the old school death metal guys and we don't really quite so on one hand, that means we get to play with all of them, which is really right. cool. Which is but good. I think people don't necessarily quite – people have a tough time nichifying or classifying or pigeonholing us into one of these easily defined categories because you don't really fit there. We've got songs that have slams. We've got songs that have breakdowns. We've got songs that have – melodic parts we've got songs that have black metal tremolo riffs we're all over the place because all of us come from such varied uh listening backgrounds that we're not content to just say okay every song is going to be verse chorus verse breakdown chorus that gets right. so boring and we have more to say than that well as you said about like you know these kind of these hyper categorizations of things if you're in a you know if 
uh, abortion survivors doing these different things. And yeah, the, the upside is that you get to play with, you know, you have the opportunity to play with these different bands. But then, but here's where, to me, the bizarreness, the duality comes in where they're, it's the audience now that kind of has this angst with like, well, what are they? What are they? What are they? Instead of just going, is this good? You know, or is it not good? You know, and, and that's I, why we, I, I don't really like that people get so focused on the labels and they get so hung up and are they this or are they that? Just just listen. And that, that, that's what I was getting at is where does the listening happen? Where well, they, they don't know and they don't care. It's like when I, I, I guess the first time I, well, I saw Ingve live perform live before I ever heard him, but I just remember it was the whole thing. I, I and, and he was opening for ACDC at the time, so I couldn't even tell you why. <laughs> what a, that's a dichotomy in and of itself. The most notes ever before the least notes ever. Yeah, it was his first. Uh, oh my God, it's 1985. <laughs> so he was he wasn't even a household name yet. He was just oh, was his first headline until he was 21. He was 21 when I saw him. So he was at the peak of his powers. I mean, you know, the peak. And But it was kind of like, it was like, you know, AC, is ACDC metal? No. It's classic rock to me. But it just seemed to work. But I think a lot of that was because, I mean, yeah, okay. If, if um, it would have been a lot different had Megadeth come out and opened for, for ACDC. I think that, you know, I don't know, but that's what I mean. Like, where does it get to the point where like, and I, and I know I'm going to sound like an old guy here, but where does it happen where people just go, Hey, like there was this really killer interview with Zappa where he was talking about back in the sixties and there would be like, it was the prototypical record executive, the fat guy with the cigar hanging around. And somebody said, Hey, we're going to put this out, and the, and the executive goes, "Yeah, put it out. See what happens." I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's any good. Just put it out. And see what happens. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like he started to see these hits, and he's like, "Hey, I'm getting a hit out of that. Uh, let's see what else is going on." Well, what happened is these new generation of executives came in who were the the coffee guys that were running to get coffee for these executives, and then they became they got into this hyper. It's got to be this, got to be that, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that in a bad way because business is business. You know, you're well, a businessman. You, you, know? you touched on something earlier that, you know, I think everything is different in the modern digital internet recording landscape where, look, I'm not shopping labels. You know, right. um, I, I, I think it's important to know what your goals and aspirations are in a band. Um, I think the the guys and I are we're all very honest with each other. Where even if we were presented with the opportunity to go on a national tour, mm -hmm. five married guys with kids and entrenched lives and mortgages and, and stuff to pay, we're, we're not we're not jaunting off on a, on a tour, even if that option were given to us, you know. Right. Um, which gives us a certain amount of flexibility when when money uh, is, is not your your defining goal. It gives you the ability to, to to give the finger to a lot of things that you you wouldn't be able to if that was your end goal. Um, so one of the advantages of being in this totally self-released industry is that we're able to do that. We're able to make all of our own decisions based on what we want to do and not what's deemed commercially viable and not what's deemed that's going to give us the most marketing potential and what's going to be our most successful thing ever. Um, maybe if we were with a label and we were under development, they'd say, okay, well, this deathcore thing is really hot these days, guys. Why don't you work on that a little bit? And, and, and I could totally see some, some guy doing that to us, and we'd say, well, all right, that works in this song, but it doesn't really work in this, this, or this song, so right. we're going to keep yeah. it as an influence, just the way it was when we yeah, got it. Yeah, and the next thing you know, it, 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 it actually ends up, in that scenario that you just described, it ends up destroying the whole reason you, you did it, the whole reason you got into it. So I agree with you that, you know, the beautiful, one of the things about this digital age is that in many ways, it's better to just stay independent and do it the way you want to do it. Because I've always been a firm believer that you can't, you can't fool an audience. You can't, 
and even if you were able to do it for a brief period of time, it won't last. And you'll end up walking away going, this is, you know, <laughs> you know you'll, mi you'll miss falling asleep on Sunday after a show the night before with the kids. You'll mm -hmm. miss that after being thrown into a world where it's like, well, wait a minute. No, that's the, no, no. You, go, go back and rewrite that. Do that again. I, I, I can't put that out, you know. And you're like, well, no, that's the piece. You're like, no, you know. Record executive is like, no, you work for me now. You know, we well, have a exactly. contract. Yeah. Look, I, I am also far from kidding myself that death metal in any subgenre is not exactly a commercially viable entity, although it is more so now than it was in years mm -hmm. past. But I'm not making my career off of this. You know, this is something well, I, I mean, for fun. This is something that I do for fulfillment. This is something that I do to make me happy. And if that isn't the be all, you know, it, it's supposed to be fun. Yeah. You know, as, as the fetals were getting towards the end, it was back in you know 2012. We had two members who were looking to focus on different aspects of music, uh, or not music at all, and you could feel that tension. And and you know, band practices stopped being fun when it was a fight to get everybody there, and. Someone's like constantly going in this direction, but the rest of you are going in this direction. And I was like, all right, you know what? Let's. We, we, I am. I am so pleased that we had the good sense to put that project to bed when we did, because at this day and age, I am still good friends with all of those guys. And if yeah. we wanted to do a reunion show, we could do so easily. There's no bad blood. There's no negativity. We're all still close with each other, or in each other's families. So that's great. Um, and that's something that's always been important to me and sort of, you know, one of my, my ground rules for coming back into the fold was like, listen, guys, this is great. But for me, this is fun. And I'm only going to do it if it's fun. As long as it's fun, right? And if it stops being fun, then we need to either look at why it's not fun anymore or I'm going to withdraw and back out and say, have fun, guys. You guys have fun because it's not fun for me anymore. And that was sort of my my my, my uh, uh, that was my tour rider for for coming back on. Uh, was that as long as it's fun, great. But as soon as it's not fun, that's when we gotta we gotta re-examine things at least. That's a great philosophy, and I think, and I've seen this philosophy in, in younger bands that I, that I that I admire because it was it's not our philosophy back then. It, you know, because what we were doing was. We called it the brass ring. We were always going for that thing. And a lot of times, you, as you just said, very poignantly, like, if you don't, it's like having a mission statement, right? It's like one of the first jobs that I had when I got hired as the music director at the Grand Opera House was I had to write a mission statement. That was the first thing my first day. They're like, write a mission statement so we can put it on the wall. Never knew what a mission statement was at the time. But I have learned that that what kind of what you just described is a mission statement in a lot of ways. It's like, and the reason that we have mission statements is so when the ship gets off course, you can go, guys, is this, is this, yeah, yeah. exactly. Gotta get back to the mission statement. And that, if that means going out to dinner with the fellows or, or having a beer or a drink, just go, guys, we got to get back to, to why we're doing this. And I think that's okay. I, I kind of think that's, there's a theme running through our, our discussion today, which I find very inspiring, is that there is a purpose. The purpose can actually be the most pure and innocent thing that makes it work. It doesn't have to be all of these other things, even though on the surface and to some outside person looking in, if they were to come in and see your organization, your band, your rehearsals and your recordings. There's almost this kind of perception like, man, these guys, man, these guys don't mess around. This is their life. This is, but it's, it is, but it's not, it's not your definition. It's we, 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 we take our product seriously. You know, we want to put out good quality music. So we're not farting on the snare drum and recording it and releasing it as an album. Right. But, but, but there's got to be a take somewhere where that actually happened and you have it somewhere in the mix. Oh, God, of course. Dear yeah. Lord. I, I, I want to make sure. Practices the what's been recorded and what hasn't been recorded. I'm sure would get us, you know, canceled from everything from now until forever. Um, but uh, but 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 we don't take. The point is fun. 
the point is to have a good time and it's to have a good time at rehearsals and it's to have a good time in the recording studio and it's to have a good time back when we used to do this thing called playing shows we would actually like get together at these places called bars or or clubs that used to exist in the before time and and i like we, that i like we, that the before time instruments on stage and there would be people who would actually pay to come see us play and when we did that we would have a damn good time and that for me and, and make sure that the people who come out to see us are having a good time right right and i think that's and, the energy that's obviously the energy that, 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 that is the energy that we're trying to bring is listen we may not be the most musically proficient band we may not be the most successful band but we're going to have a great time and if you're here with us you're going to have a great time too and if we're not having a great time in the background, that's never going to happen. Right. In other words, exactly. And that's exactly where I was going. If you're not internally happy within the band and, and staying with your mission statement, which is fun, because that's the infection. That's the infectiousness of the audience. The audience like I said, you can't fool an audience. They're going to know. They're going to know. Even if, even if you're playing the most brilliant show you've ever played, the audience feels something. They're like... I don't think these guys like each other, <laughs> yeah, you know. But if you have that feel where the two, the band, is just it, it, it literally you can you you can feel it. So, which leads me to kind of what's next for you guys, especially with um you know, with with everything that's going on. You you haven't, you haven't played out, I'm sure. Are there? Are you continuing to work? What's what's next for the band? So um, just a little, you know, State of the Union. Uh, so we released our first uh, EP in September of 2020. Uh, okay. Six songs. Uh, that's available to stream everywhere music is streaming. It's also available to purchase on Spotify or on, uh, excuse me, on Bandcamp, um, abortionsurvivor.bandcamp.com. Um, so that's sort of what we're we're working off of currently uh we also have a youtube channel we have the three songs from our demo and three songs from the ep that have you know actual music videos uh all, some of them are entirely self-produced some of them we had some outside assistance with uh thanks walt lebowski um but uh next up for us we are already halfway through writing songs for the next chapter in our musical career um, we're probably doing a three mini album cycle. So the first album was Tales from the Back Alley, Chapter 1. Next is going to be Chapter 2. Then we're going to have Chapter 3. And then maybe even do a, a physical deluxe package with all three of those, those works put together. Oh, that's cool. We're already halfway through writing material for the new album. And nice. then the last one's been out for less than three months already. So we're already you know making uh, major roads there. Um, another thing that we're going to be hopefully putting together, I don't have any concrete details yet. Uh, but, you know, I've talked a little bit about, you know, shows and performing and sort of the, the sad state of the music industry in, in, in 2020 and 2021. Um, so um, I'm not sure if you're a, a Delco guy or a Philly guy, but you may have oh, heard I'm of Oh, Delco, me. baby. Okay, so then I'm sure you know about the uh, the Rusty Nail on Haverford. Yeah, Africa. yeah. Yeah, okay. I was going to I was gonna talk to you about that. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Well, so, so, you know, the, the Rusty Nail has been... My personal home away from home, I live three blocks away, oh, wow. uh, as well as, you know, my entire band's home away from home. We played our first shows there. Uh, Maddie and Jay ran live sound there for a little bit. Jay's wife, Jackie, bartended there. Um, I've been going there for more years than my age should allow. Um, and it, it, it's been a great place for us to sort of cut our teeth both in, in previous projects and as well as in, the, in this project as well. And obviously, you know, just like any other uh, uh, business that is counting on performance and in in-room entertainment to pay the bills, they are, they are suffering terribly. Yeah. Uh, so there is definitely a GoFundMe page, uh, hashtag save the nail. Um, if you're in or around Delco, if you've got anything to spare, they're actually doing really well. I think they're about uh, uh, six thousand dollars away from their 25k goal. Um, so I'm gonna make a major push for everyone to go out there. Go to GoFundMe.com, search "Save the Save the Nail," "Save the Rusty Nail." Um, 
I'll send you guys links so you can put up on the page maybe oh, later. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put all um, for sure. But, uh, you know, right now they're doing a, sort of a, 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 a audience-less concert series. Yes. Streaming. I was going to ask, are you, are you guys going to be on that bill? So uh, we certainly hope to be able to assist in some way, whether it's us streaming from the practice spot or bringing the gear down to the nail and playing a, an actual you know, in-person set. Uh, we, we all feel very powerfully about this establishment and the, the benefit that it's given us and the community sure. over the past 40 years. So we really hope to do whatever we can to help make sure that this uh, mainline institution keeps going. So uh, no details as of yet, but stay tuned to our social media. As soon as things are, are firmed up, we'll definitely be announcing that and, and uh, letting everyone know what's going on with that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've performed at the Nail, and uh, it's always been a pleasant, pleasant experience, especially, especially dealing with the owners, man. They're so great. And I, oh, I, I, right. I love their broad scope. They have such a broad scope of, of music. In other words, they, you know, it's, what do you got? absolute man and like you said you can go from a death metal show on friday night to a blues jam on saturday right. to uh, an acoustic singer songwriter on sunday um the nail is another online radio show that we've done a couple times in terms of promoting our band promoting our oh, music yeah. getting the name out there uh the nail one.com is where you can find that okay. uh, and, and chris the owner is, is he is just the nicest guy uh right. he's getting every opportunity anytime that we want to book a show just great guys give me a date let me know he makes it makes it makes it uh very special for us you know uh in in the fields i think we played new year's at the nail maybe four or five times and that was sort of an our, our annual holiday party was to just get everybody together home away from home you know, Chris did some 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 well specials and 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 drink specials, and it was just and it was it was a party, and it felt like it was our place. And so I, I want to make sure that that uh, that 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 spirit gets carried on for for people in the future to be able to use yeah. as well. No, absolutely, I agree. That's awesome, uh, Sam. I've had a blast hanging with you today, and uh, uh, it's been great. Well, I love. Uh, Love picking your brain about a lot of stuff, man. There's some, there's some cool stuff there. It's it's cool. That's important, and I think it's I think discussing stuff like that is is always good, and it's of course very educating. So very much appreciate it. And um, yeah, we're gonna put all those links in there. Not only that, you know, which is important, the nail for sure, save the nail. But we're also gonna put links to the to the band, the band camp, and uh, you know all this stuff. Looking forward to uh, hearing more stuff from you guys. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Right. Keep keep your eyes and ears peeled. Uh, we should have some new stuff coming out shortly. Um, obviously, you know, COVID and pandemic is putting a pretty big damper on our our major plans. Um, we haven't even practiced in the last two months. Once you know, sort of this this new wave came back and hit. Yeah. But uh, not gonna keep us down. And uh, here's to big news and big things coming in the future. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Sam Hunterberger, everyone. All right, thanks I'm for having Sam me on. Right. I'm Chris Gordon. And uh, stay tuned. There's a lot more, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put the links below. And uh, definitely check out Abortion Survivor. And uh, it'll be a great time. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.